new year and a new season for the Rugby Paper Podcast. Fair to say we are starting 2023 off with a bang, as myself, Nick Kane and Brendan Gallagher are joined by former England captain, flanker and World Cup winner Lewis Moody. Lewis talks about his absolutely incredible charity work and then the four of us endeavour to pick an England 15 for the Six Nations opener against Scotland. Happy New Year, everyone. Just Brendan with me for the moment. Nick Kane is currently having his teeth pulled, so hopefully he'll turn up halfway through. Brendan, how are you? How was your Christmas? Not too bad, barring an ear infection, but uh, soldiering on. Okay, soldiering on. (laughs) Good way to start the year. Well, I hope the ear infection is subsiding. Now, very special guest today, we're with former England flanker, captain, World Cup winner, Lewis Moody. How are you, Lewis? How was your Christmas? Uh, it sounds sounds better than uh, than Brendan's. We had, uh, although slightly more chaotic, we had twenty seven um, family members in uh, in wow. Dorset. Some people's worst nightmare, but I love it. I've oh, got the dog here joining me. Just yeah, I've, I've just seen the dog. Unfortunately, it's not it's not a uh, visual podcast. But hello, Lewis's dog. What's the, what's the dog's name? <laughs> dog's name is uh, is Ziggy, and uh, he'll be keeping me company by the way. But uh, oh, but no, I had, had a wonderful Christmas. Thank you. Fantastic, fantastic. And if the dog makes any contributions to our rugby analysis, I'm sure it will be better than the stuff we come up with. We, we <laughs> did have, was it was it uh, Chris Hewitt's dog, Brendan, wasn't it, that has made a few appearances? Yeah, you're right, he did. No, Chris, today he is in Australia, so wishing him a very good trip. Now, before we get to you, Lewis, I'm just going to forecast for our listeners that in the second half of this episode, we will be picking an England 15 for the Six Nations opener against Scotland in one month's time. We were just talking about it off air and it does sound like it's going to be a tortuous task. We will give it our best shot. So stick around for that. Lewis, are you calling us from Dorset then? No, mate. No, I'm back in uh, I'm back in Wiltshire. So we had uh, we had like a week away with uh, with the with a family. I'm an only child, so my family's quite yeah. uh, quite small. My wife's got seven siblings, so that's where the majority <laughs> yeah. are. <laughs> but no, this is home. I'm home now, mate. While you're here, I want to talk about the Lewis Moody Foundation, which I'm guessing takes up a decent amount of your time at the moment. It was started in 2014. First of all, for people that don't know, tell us about it. Tell us about, I know about the inspiration, but for people that don't know, tell us about Joss and what brought it about for you. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, so, so actually, it was just after I retired in 2012. I got a letter off uh, off Joss's dad, Graham, and uh, and he was just informing me of. Of Joss's illness, and he was a young rugby player, played up at Sheffield. Was there anything I could do to support him? So, um, having just retired, I had a bit of time on my hands, despite the fact that I lived up in Sheffield and I was down in Bath. So, I went up, saw saw Joss. He was fourteen at the time, and met his team and did a training session. Dumped a load of old kit up there that they could flog off, and we just kept in touch over the next sort of year and a half, two years. And I got another message uh, from Graham about a year and a half later saying, Josh is having a bit of a tough time. If there was anything I could do, it would be greatly appreciated because he had a younger brother, Leo, as well. And it, as is always the case in these situations, the priority goes on the, on the ill child and you know, often the, the other sibling gets sort of left behind and um, not forgotten about, but deprioritised maybe. Yeah. So we looked at something we could do together. So we took him to, Twi- to Twickenham to watch, a, to watch a game. And and I thought at the time, I think it was 2015, 14 a game that I sort of knew we'd win and at that time the Welsh weren't doing so well so we picked the Welsh game and uh, and thankfully we won and uh, we went down into the change rooms afterwards took all the you know took took Joss and, uh, and Leo Joss's brother uh, went down into the change rooms Chris Robshaw was captain and kind of invited us in met all the boys had post-match afterwards up in the spirit of hospitality you guys would have been there um, spirit of rugby sorry you guys would have been there a million times um and, and we sat down with the players and Joss got to meet and we did photographs autographs went around the room um it was just a brilliant day and afterwards Graham just said mate that, that was perfect boys and it was probably about three days later that he called me he said that the boys you know smiles uh, memorabilia everywhere it, it was perfect and at the end of the call just said look Joss sadly has lost his battle with cancer though um, yesterday, so uh, you know, it was it was days after we got to take him around, and and it was a, just a focal point for me and for me and Annie. You know, it was one of those moments in your life. You think this this young man who had everything at his feet suddenly had it all snuffed out, taken away, and um, me and Annie just decided to focus all of our attention on supporting young families with brain tumors, living with brain tumors. So since then, since two thousand and fourteen, that's where all of our charitable in, endeavors have really focused, and we've raised money uh, and awareness around that brain tumour topic. And, and the way that we've done the, the fundraising has been taking people on challenges. You know, it's sort of, there's a slightly 
selfish undertone to this element of it is that I also get to to go and join some crazy challenges, which you know keeps me motivated uh, and active. Um, but taking people along with me. Um, so the first one was to the North Pole, which was extreme and <laughs> maybe a bit punchy for the first one. <laughs> but I had a <laughs> mate of mine who lives in Bristol is a polar explorer, Alan Chambers, and who's a wonderful human being. And he said, mate, you know, we should do something for the charity. You know, if you're going to do something, we should go to the North Pole. I was like, no, I think that's a bit punchy for the first, first challenge. <laughs> we did it. It was amazing. I took Danny Grucock and Josh Lucy with me as well. And, you know, since then we've, we've continued to do that. And this year I'm trying to reduce the amount of time that I – commit to challenges each year because I love them and could quite easily get caught up in them um, but I have to work and support the family as well so I've got one challenge a year now and um, this year's is going to be a thousand kilometer cycle from southern France to northern France along the for any historians out along the old western front way so it's yeah. uh, it, it's a fairly new route but it was started um, after the first world war off of the back of a, a letter uh, and I've completely forgotten the name of the chap now but who served and died on the western front and thought that there should be a peace march, a peace route. So we'll be following that route all the way up to northern France, hopefully finishing by taking in the uh, in the Samoa game in the World Cup afterwards with uh, with twenty uh, intrepid uh, and excitable uh, people. So if anyone wants to, if anyone fancies it, so we still have places uh, available at the minute because it's only actually just gone out. It's on the website, so lewismoodyfoundation.org. Check it out. There's a number of other bits and pieces out there um, that you can get involved with. But as I said, I'm I'm trying to reduce it because I got really excited last year. Did. <laughs> The Amazon with a mate of mine, Tom Croft. Nice. That was two weeks in the jungle trying to survive. And then came back to Hadrian's Wall. I can't remember how far that was now, but that seemed a breeze in comparison. And then followed that immediately with the bath half. And my knees have not, <laughs> have not you know, forgiven me for, for putting them through that. So I'm still struggling slightly at the minute. But, but yeah, so that's the basis of the foundation. And we've managed to raise over 2 million to date, which is... Uh, you know, for me and my wife and and all the people that support us is 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 a big deal. No, it's phenomenal, and that was my next question: how much you'd managed to raise? Just on the lighter element of the foundation, obviously, I know there's a an element that's very deep to your heart, but you also really enjoy the work that you do. What's been your favourite challenge that you've done? You mentioned the Rainforest Hadrian's Wall. I'm guessing you've been doing yearly challenges or multiple challenges a year for eight years now. Yeah, yes, yeah. so we've done Vietnam and Cambodia, which was again a thousand kilometer cycle. We did uh, Costa Rica, a crossing of Costa Rica, which sounds impressive. It's not actually that far. It's like uh, <laughs> 400 miles, which in comparison to some of the other stuff isn't that far. But when you're going through uh, jungle, you're on sort of kayaks in a crocodile and shark infested waters which was where we entered the water the guy was like right lads this is where the sort of the the crocodiles and the sharks come to feed so you know when you're getting in the canoe just try not to go in too far into the water and literally in 30 seconds of him saying that one of the the group that was with us sort of the you know as the sea goes out there can suddenly be a drop off stepped off that drop off and, and disappeared momentarily she came up very quickly as you could imagine to get yeah. back in the canoe so probably out of all of them done the north and south pole along the way the hardest without a shadow of a doubt was the north pole but probably the most enjoyable was was costa rica because it had we had cycling had trekking through the jungle it had kayaking across you know some pretty inhospitable water you know sleeping out in the in the jungle and spiders and all snakes and and this guy who was, I, mean, I always get the name wrong. I can't remember if it's a naturist or a naturalist. I think it's a nature naturist, but he wasn't nude. So the one that was more about <laughs> nature, he, he would he would wander around. Like, and we'd be going through the jungle and he'd be like just picking up a tarantula and then pointing out sort of, you know, poisonous snakes. And, you know, it was a wonder, really wonderful experience with a, with a great group of, of people. So Costa Rica is probably the most enjoyable North Pole enjoyable because it was so tough and, and getting through it with a group of my old mates was was wicked as well i think a naturist is the nude one isn't it oh is it the other one <laughs> yeah naturist, nat- naturist maybe <laughs> I, 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 I probably should google that don't put me on the record for saying <laughs> skydiving has piqued my interest brendan is it your sort of vibe any of this sort of stuff oh well back in the day when i when the body work yeah definitely um did a bit of uh you needed a bit of, sort of parachuting uh, you know everybody did this sort of um challenge jump uh yeah and a bit of canoeing surfing that sort of stuff but that's a long time ago now Ollie. i've always wanted i've always <laughs> but, uh, wanted it sounds really, the north pole one sounds fantastic because yeah, that is a treacherous trip you know that's not i mean well, all of these trips sound have their challenges but north pole combination of ice and, and water um moving 
uh, ice pack, and that, I imagine that was pretty hairy at times, Lewis. Um, yeah, it's not that's not a light undertaking. No, mate, and I think you know maybe that's sort of part of the my uh, I don't know what the right way of putting it. The the beauty of me and the and the danger of me is that I, I sort of someone says you know let's go do the North Pole. I'm like okay can't be that hard <laughs> sort of my <laughs> immediate thought process and then when you get into the reality of it I was like oh my goodness um, and I'll tell you now Brendan the worst bit by far which I didn't even cross my mind might be challenging was was the journey there so you go we went from Norway northern Norway Svalbard and you take this tiny little short takeoff um, I think it's called an Antonov Russian plane mm. had two windows that were the size of your fists in the entire plane it's basically like a cargo plane so you can't see, and it's a four-hour trip, and uh, and five of our group got put in the hold because they didn't have enough seats. So it wasn't like uh, it wasn't like lads. Yeah, if we could have five volunteers, we're going to take you off, and you can go on another flight. There weren't any other flights. You're coming off, and you're going in the hold because we slightly missed. I mean, it was just the whole experience was bonkers. And as we landed, me and Danny Grucock were sat next to each other in all our sort of warm kit, ready to go, and. Uh, and as we landed, there must have been a little crack in the ice because the Russians are incredible. They go out and they prep, they clear the, the runway, they put up all the tents, they make a base camp. And uh, <clears throat> there must have been a crack formed across the runway after they'd cleared the snow off the top of the ice. And as we came in, the, the pilot had to put it down really hard to try and avoid it, but still slid over it. And the part of the hydraulic part of the, it's the wheel as it comes down, the hydraulics of that collapsed and came through the fuselage so we started sliding down the runway on one side and, me, and <laughs> Danny Grucock had sort of half collapsed in his chair and I think the weight of his body had just collapsed into the person behind him but um we got we got everyone got off absolutely fine and it didn't seem like a, a stress or anything at the time but it then made the trip itself seem slightly easier because of like oh, anything but getting back on that plane is going to be a breeze at the minute and actually the moment of getting to the north pole there do you actually because obviously it's, it's moving revolving ice so there's nothing permanent like the south pole but is there a sort of a ceremony you have to do and you have to take you have to get the recording i presume you have to get the measurements absolutely bang on to know you're at the north pole yeah well so alan has this gps that obviously tracks us and as you say brendan that it's not a fixed point so you're only ever on the north pole for like a nanosecond and then it's moved yeah. again so you're sort of within <laughs> region of it <laughs> you're within a region i mean you can walk around for ages you know trying to follow it um, but once we got once we got to one bearing point, Alan was like, "Lads, that's that's it. We're here. We're sort of pitch tents." Because it also once you've reached it as well, you then think, "Right, that's the end." You then you know you've used up the majority of rations. You might have a few left. You put up, you pitch up a tent. You call base. They'll come and get you when they can, <laughs> basically, which could be you know a couple of hours. It could be a couple of days. So you don't want to then demolish all your rations. Get super excited. Drink all the shots of whiskey. And the ritual that we went through. So Alan had this uh, this uh, this tot of rum that he took with him on all of his trips. He'd been to the North Pole like fifteen times or something crazy. Um, but the ritual we decided to, uh, to to go with was was play a little game of rugby, which was which was slightly challenging in massive uh, warm weather gear, yeah, yeah. mitts, shoes, but highly entertaining. I've never laughed so much for the five minutes that we could muster the energy to to run around whilst we were there but Danny Grucock and me and Josh taking it fairly lightly and a couple of the Marines we did it with the Marines charity <laughs> got, very, got very excited and one of the 60 year old lads that was uh, a part of WICO who are a, a wonderful company that supported the foundation over the years he touched the ball and we started with a game of touch and it was like true Leicester style <laughs> a 60 year old gets the ball expecting to be touched and gets absolutely crucified by one of the Marines and that set the the next five minutes but um oh mate amazing experience but you're right <laughs> you, you don't you don't appreciate when you get there that there's the north pole's moving so you're literally yeah. there for a second and then it's moved again it must have been yeah. a good moment for josh i remember doing some stuff with him when he did everest didn't he and um yeah number one he couldn't believe how crowded everest was you know because it was there's a season isn't there when you can only do it and then he got quite a long way up didn't he when he got um was it him who got ill or his mate got ill uh, with the the altitude sickness, and he had to you know, come back, and you know, you know, Josh better than I do, but you know, for Josh to not not complete the task would be a pretty big thing for him. So to do to actually do the North, North Pole, I'd imagine he was uh, pretty wild about that. Yeah, he was, mate. And he t he talked about Everest whilst we were there. He said that um, he had a crack in his oxygen tank, which meant when he got to the, I think it was a like hundred meters from the top or something, that he realised he wasn't going to have enough oxygen. And he then had to make, uh, he then had to, and for me, this is 
this was a brilliant decision because so many people I imagine would get there and think, well, I'm that close, especially as you're a bigger competitor as Josh is. Mm. I'm that close. I'm just going to push on and do it. I'm sure it can't be that risky. But he made a good decision and, and turned around because, you know, as we know, sadly, many people have um, have not made it back down Everest. So, yeah, yeah. yeah I, was, I, was, I was delighted to take him and uh, and delighted that he, he made it yeah, safe and sound as we all did. Have you always been, even before the Lewis Moody Foundation, have you always been a, th- I know, obviously, nicknamed Mad Dog, which <clears throat> for many was rugby related, but have you always been that thrill seeker type? Um, I did, no, I, I would never, I would never consider myself a, a thrill seeker as such. Like, I hate heights. Like, talking about skydiving, I know, you know, that's one of our challenges. Like, uh, this is the last thing in the world I would ever, ever go and do. I mean, I did a, I did a bungee jump once just to prove that I could conquer my fear of heights. I hated every single second of it, <laughs> sitting, waiting, going down and coming up, and I'll never do it again. So, I don't know, I don't know if it's the thrill seeking. It's more just the, the sense of doing something like having a collective goal again and working through something that is uniquely challenging that really excites me and and when you do it with people that you know some people you know well some people you won't know at all when you come together for those moments weeks days and you achieve something like reaching the north pole or crossing costa rica or you know cycling vietnam and camp there, there's just something super special about it. It reminds me a little bit of being back in my playing days, you know, um, different, but but gives me a little bit of that connection again. And uh, so, yeah, no, I wouldn't describe myself as ever really having been a thrill seeker. I've just always loved challenges. On, I suppose maybe loved challenging myself to see what I'm capable of, like that skydive. I like that, you know, skydive, the bungee jump. I like proving that even if I don't, want to do it don't like doing it i can do it if i have to i suppose is the uh, is the uh, is the ultimate side of it but uh but doing it with good people along the way mate, it's uh, i'm sure you guys have done stuff that's uh that's that's out there and testing yourself as well but there's something properly exhilarating about it, it brings you it makes you feel alive so that's the best way to describe it i think i'm gonna have to add some of this to my list because what the stuff i've done is tame compared to north pole vietnam cambodia but no it, it's absolutely phenomenal i'm just curious how Obviously, with the fundraising, it seems very much based on in-person activities that, you know, uh, incite donations. I would imagine the pandemic made things quite difficult then. Yeah, very much so. Obviously, so as you said, we're, we were largely an events-based um, charity, so taking people on challenges. Um, we'd have a yearly dinner. Um, we have a clay pigeon shoot organised by one of our um, ambassadors, Tyrone. And, and a few other little bits. Um, but again, so they're all events. So when lockdown happened, everything stopped. So we went from completing the South Pole just in time, January, um, what would that have been, 2020? And obviously two months later, we went into lockdown. So that year we had probably our biggest fundraising year. Um, and then all of a sudden in lockdown, we had we had our, well, I was nervous we weren't going to raise a single penny, quite honestly. Um, but we had a great team at the foundation um wonderful lady called claire wormley um who's now not with us sadly she's moved on to set up her own business but um yeah we 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 like everyone moved into the virtual world and we had virtual online events um we had um auctions and also so we still managed to raise during lockdown in in 2020 or well, the first year um just over a hundred thousand which was you know significantly down on the previous year but uh, but we still find a way i suppose that sort of adapt and overcome type mentality right yeah um, nice. we still had lots of you know areas to support you know our, the foundation those me foundation supports specific areas um linked within the brain tumor charity which is a big overarching charity in uh, in this country um so if we're not raising money all of a sudden those projects that we that we fund all those individual researchers that we fund um the days the events mm-hmm. They can't happen, so we still had to figure out a way of uh, of doing something, which we did. Um, and thankfully, now events are coming back. Tough. It was tough for tough for two years. Well, I also wonder whether, and this is my own personal curiosity, whether there was then a movement. Obviously, the pandemic made people realize, okay, we're stuck inside. Life's a bit too short. Whether people have been wanting to do that sort of stuff, it sounds like the sort of things that the Lewis Moody Foundation does. It's kind of bucket list type things. Do you find that people have sort of flock towards these sorts of events now where they're maybe wanting that little bit of an adrenaline rush i know that 
films such as Top Gun coming out have made people realize, okay, yeah, you know, Tom Cruise has sort of generated this very Hollywood thrill seeking culture. Do you actually think that might make a difference? What a great movie, by the way. I thought that, that would be absolute dross after I got my kids to watch the first one, which they didn't, they sort of got, but they didn't quite understand because it looked like it was made, you know, 300 years ago. Yeah. Um, and we went and watched Maverick. Oh, I absolutely loved it. Absolutely loved it. Um, in answer to your, and that's your question. It's been mixed, actually. So that's exactly what we expected, that there would be, you know, events, companies that put on events would be inundated. Um, but I think part of the reality of lockdown is that people have got people got used to being comfortable and not wanting to take risks. Um, so there, there, well, there has been a real mix. You know, I'm glad to say that the, the events we have run, you know, we've had we've still had good numbers on. We've been able to uh, to put on. We haven't had to cancel any. Um, we postponed some during lockdown, obviously. But there seems to be now a little bit more energy towards it as as we're moving away from lockdown and normality is sort of is a normality, a new normality is sort of returning and people are wanting to get active and be out there. Yeah, but it's still challenging as as always, you know, any any charitable organization or foundation, the hardest thing is is getting people involved and, you know, constantly asking for people's support and donations. But yeah, so it, Ollie, there's no simple answer to that question is yeah, it's uh it's a mixed bag, but I think gradually people are starting to get excited again, hopefully. Yeah, well... I I'm going to be excited by our next challenge. Yeah, what... You get to in a World Cup as well. As a bit of sport. <laughs> That's so true, yeah. What's there not to be excited about? Now, just one final question on it. From looking at your website, it seemed like there were three prongs to where the money goes, or it was fairly <laughs> clear. Research, support, and awareness. Could you just give the breakdown? I'm sure they overlap of why those things are so important when it comes to brain tumors as a whole. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the 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 simple answer to that is that you know brain tumors are the biggest cancer killer of under forties by none um, and children, uh, and yet for the best part of you know twenty thirty years has received the smallest percentage of cancer funding. Uh, thankfully, you know, and sadly, due to the likes of Tessa Jowell, uh, sadly passing away from from a brain tumor she did a huge amount to raise awareness in in her circles and, and through her through her position uh, her, her daughter's also taken that on so <clears throat> she created the tessa Jow brain matrix and there's lots of other um, projects out there around brian and um, around ways of accessing information so that people can pick it up earlier so obviously the same as any illness cancer um, the quicker you pick it up the the better the outcome so with those simple stats in mind, you know, raising awareness was was the key approach that we took when we started the foundation and the Head Smart campaign, which is about getting early diagnosis information out there to schools, um, to opticians, to GPs, um, has been groundbreaking. And uh, and the people that put it together at the Brain Tumor Charity have, uh, you know, have rightly uh, um, been recognised for that. And then so beyond the awareness, it's actually funding the research to make sure that we can start to make a, a difference um, and start to reduce the impact that surgery and intervention has on people suffering and living with brain tumors and hopefully increase the the life expectancy of of, of people that are diagnosed and uh, and as i said you know the brain tumor charity is the uh, is the overarching organization that do incredible work and we're a small part of supporting the brilliant work that that they do and the projects that they fund so um, it, that wasn't a particularly short answer but raising awareness for for an illness that 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 needs more input, more resources, so that more out more positive outcomes can be uh, can be what's the right word can be achieved. There you go, achieved, the right yeah. word. Yeah. You know, it's not massively dissimilar to M and D. You know, the wonderful work that Doddy and Kevin Sinfield, Rob Burrow, all these guys um, that are being diagnosed with an illness that is essentially incurable at the minute. They have done wonderful work in progressing that now, and hopefully, because of that, there will be some cures in the in the not too distant future, or at least some ways of reducing the impact. And we're, we're in the same position with brain tumors. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's all absolutely phenomenal work. So it sounds like the Lewis Moody foundation is doing absolutely fantastic things. So huge credit to you for keeping that going through lockdown. And now obviously, hopefully things are getting a little bit easier and good luck with the bike ride as well. When is it? So it's 30th of September to 
to the 8th of October. So it's seven days on the on the bike, long days, thousand kilometers to cover in seven seven days. It's going to be punchy. But yeah. all of our all of our challenges are just about getting everyone from A to B. So there's no there's no race. Um, it's yeah. just about getting there and getting there safely. I think you said earlier, but just to repeat, if anyone listening wants to get involved, it's the Louis the Lewis Moody Foundation dot org. That's right, mate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the Louis me. I was watching uh, King Louis the Fourteenth last night. Uh, I don't know why that slipped into my mind. You saying Louis completely? <laughs> Sorry, random. I've actually, Sorry. I've actually. It's quite the Lewis Moody found. I've butchered it twice now. The Lewis Moody Foundation. <laughs> Those that may or may not make the thank edit. you, thank you for putting it out there. No, 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 absolutely, it definitely deserves to be put out there. And if the Lewis Moody Foundation wasn't enough, you've recently got involved in another campaign, which I know a lot less about, and I'm sure a lot of people know a lot less about, um, because awareness in this domain certainly isn't there. I know you feel that as well. So rather than claim what I know, I'm just going to say stools for all and let you introduce it, Lewis. Yeah, thanks, bud. So um, the stools for all campaign came about. So it's a male incontinence uh, campaign, basically, trying to get more uh, more bins available in male toilets. So for, for people that don't know, during my playing career, I was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis, so it's bowel disease, basically, um, which meant at times getting to the loo was, was nigh on impossible, even if you were like two feet high from it, which had... Um, not amusing consequences at the time but when i look back now you know i can i can laugh about it you know if you uh, if you don't quite make it or you're in the car trying to make it you know all the things and the thought processes that you have to go through when you're living with something like that so they change your clothes um being prepped early but if you do have an issue and you have an accident you don't make it to the toilet on time you then need it to change and if you have uh you know male toilets generally don't have any facilities to discard incontinence items you know you just have the low so um, it's a campaign to try and <clears throat> raise awareness of that and just get bins available in uh, in all or well, in all toilets basically not just um not just in one kind so uh that that's the basis and the premise of it and just raising a bit of awareness around uh um <clears throat> a disease that is quite debilitating well very debilitating at times when you're living with it incredibly stressful when you're in the in the throes of it um i like to you know, say now that fortunately my um, my colitis is is being dealt with really well. I suffer very few issues these days, um, but there was a time when I was playing that it was an absolute nightmare. And it's you know how I you know when I look back and how I got through it, I was just blessed that I had the sort of sportsman's mindset that nothing nothing can't be overcome. You know, so you just deal with it as another challenge, and, and that's what it was. But, but yeah, the Stools Rule campaign that's what it's about. Yours is ulcerative colitis, colitis. Right? Yeah. yeah, but there are lots of sort of subcategories to incontinence it's a more common issue than people realize isn't it i can't remember the exact stats but a lot of men suffer from it yeah they do um and i can't remember the exact stats off the top of my mind now but but there's a large proportion of people that um that suffer and suffer in silence and, and like all of these things you know the fact that you you have to think that you go through it in silence is one of the biggest challenges um it's your toilet habits are never something that people want to talk about and the irony of it is, you know, talking about my personal circumstances is when you do start speaking about it, it relieves the stress. Stress is a, you know, is a big trigger for for certain issues, um, well, for for a lot of issues. And so, if you can eradicate one of those elements that are causing you uh, your problems, then then that's better. So, you know, the the conversations, the opening up the conversations through, you know, campaigns like Store for All, or you know, just this uh, this conversation in itself, Ollie, is. Uh, it is helpful, but um, but for the stats, you know, you can go to the Stools for All campaign um, and look at the website and uh, and pick up more information. But yeah, whether it's you know um, bladder or bowel incontinence, um, there are many people out there dealing with it who you would have no idea. And actually, the large proportion of, um, I think the stat that has just come to mind, it was twenty five percent are under the age of thirty when diagnosed with an incontinence. So I was twenty five as a good example. You know, whereas I always thought it was something that 60 and 70 year olds could deal with. And I had yeah. no appreciation for how hard it was. It was like, well, why couldn't they why couldn't they control going to the loop? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'd find out very quickly when I didn't get it. <clears throat> yeah, stats just come to my mind as well. I think it's 20 million in the UK, 20 million adults in the UK suffer with bladder or bowel problems of some sort. That's obviously I know stores for always more male oriented, so I guess you know, divide yeah. that how you will, but a very significant number nonetheless and maybe this is this question has an obvious answer i'm do you think it being su- such a taboo subject is you know the answer is simply because 
humans just are a bit grossed out by it as a subject? Yeah, I think so. I think it's part of our learned behaviors, isn't it? You know, over generations, you know, depending on you know how you were raised and how your parents were raised, it's it's generally things that weren't spoken about. Um, and it, it it feels embarrassing because of that um, when people do start talking about it. I think only when, like anything in life, we don't know what we don't know, right? So as soon as you do start trying to speak about it, you realise that people have great empathy for the situation that you find yourself in. And actually, like me, I spoke to um, one of my, my club coaches at the time, who's the first, one of the first people I spoke to about it after dealing with it for a year and a half without saying anything turned out he had something similar so he could he could empathize greatly and and the more you can speak about it you know the easier it is then to leave a classroom for instance or you know a meeting if I was at training or the more people know the more uh, empathy they have towards your situation and the ability to support you as well I think so yeah when would you say the breakthrough moment for you was I suppose, you know, there has to come a point of acceptance. And like you say, it was very debilitating as a player. And it does sound like a very debilitating issue. It sounds like you're very accepting of it now. When would you say you managed to get to that stage? And what happened for you to be able to do that? Good question. I think it probably um, <clears throat> two or three years after my diagnosis. So it was around, <clears throat> I was diagnosed just before my Lions tour in 2005. And I would say by 2000 and eight, nine. I had some really big issues during the World Cup in 2007. Um, thankfully, I had my wife on hand and she was able to support me through that. I think that those moments made me realise, okay, I really need to get on top of this. I was I was full of a concoction of chemicals from my playing days of anti-inflammatories, painkillers, steroid injections to, to dry out joints, the multiple operations that I'd had that had other chemicals thrown into me. I was then on drugs for, um, for my colitis. Uh, you're then on supplements for maintaining weight and all those joint health other things so I felt like a chemical factory quite frankly at the time and basically just went cold turkey on it and for me this is what works and I'm conscious that there are multiple different ways of and everyone is unique so but for me this worked it was purely focusing on um, on my diet and nutrition so I cut out all chemicals <clears throat> any any drugs anything you know anti-inflammatories even the steroids that I was on for uh, um, for my colitis so that's a that was a an eminent that was, that was um, taken through an enema, which was, you know, at the time embarrassing as well. And and over the course of a year, cut out everything from my diet, started reintroducing really slowly week one, boiled chicken, broccoli, then some oily fish. And then it was just a slow process, drinks. And I'd, I'd figure out what, what affected me and what flared me. And, uh, and that was a simple way that I got to it. But yeah, so that World Cup in 2007, where I really struggled, um, that was probably the, the catalyst to make me sort it out and having a wife and a, and a, and a mum who were prepared to do, you know, extra research and, and understanding around it as well, because it was never one of my strengths. I have to admit, I just want to get on and do, um, yeah. they, they help. Yeah. They help me understand why and how to do it. There will, there'll obviously be sufferers from this listening. And I think the great thing about it is it's probably great to hear someone like you be able to talk about it. So thank you for doing that. And we really are going to have to move on now. Um, so yeah. I'm sorry for cutting this section a little bit short, but it is so, so great oh. to hear about all the stuff you're doing because it is just phenomenal. Still on you, but a little bit more of a chaotic note. Uh, it's time for your Random Rugby 15. First ran Random Rugby 15 of 2023. Should we get going? Yeah. Nickname. Mad Dog. Well, wow. That, that was my playing nickname. My other nicknames outside of the only people that ever called me that were uh, were, uh, were were you guys, really. It was the, the media <laughs> and people that I bumped into, the fans that <laughs> thought everyone called me it. But, um, but Mudos was my, my nickname by, to everyone else. Oh, nice. Okay. Which do you prefer out of Mad Dog and Mudos? Mudos. Oh, I love Mad Dog. It's, I wish my nickname was Mad Dog. <laughs> <laughs> it was a cool nickname to have if you're going to be given one. It's so cool. Best rugby memory. Oh. Uh, Probably my first game for the Tigers. I mean, growing up as a kid, getting to play for your schoolboy team was really special. And having my teacher, who was the first team coach at the time, give me my shirt. Most embarrassing rugby memory? Running into the post when I was 11, trying to run it out. I was a centre, trying to run it out from my own try line. Turn around, oh, wow. Knocked out cold. <laughs> and what was the ensuing thing that happened? Did the other team score? I have no recollection <laughs> at all. <laughs> I remember waking up. I remember lying on the floor thinking, oh, why am I dreaming in the middle of a game? And then I, I sort of came, came around. I think they probably stopped the game straight away, to be honest. Yeah, I don't, I, 
mate, I was 11. No, I can't remember anything. <laughs> I'm just wondering whether the ref was like, yeah, play on. You know, you presumably didn't um, ground the ball properly. You didn't have the awareness to, but no. Nice. Yeah. Pre, pre-game tune. Oh, that's easy. Foo Fighters, my hero. Love it. Post-game meal. Devastating. Uh, post-game meal. Weirdly, sushi. Okay, interesting. Haven't had that one yet. Yeah. Best player you've played against? Again, easy, Richie McCaw. I've had that one before. Best player you've played with? Not as easy. I would say Martin Johnson for a raft of reasons. There are there are a lot of players who are awesome. Jordan Murphy, Johnny Wilkinson. But John was probably the most consistent and inspirational. Favourite player right now? Oh, probably Henry Arundel, although he, he's he's had a pretty nice. uh, tough time of injuries. One, because he's he was local to Bradford on Avon, um, which is where I live. He played at the club. But he is sensational when he gets the ball. Rugby idol. Oh, well, as a kid, it was Will Carling. Interesting. Bradford on Avon as well, wasn't he? Will Carling, was he? I, I think so, yeah. I think the family as well. That is a, that is a great piece of snippet, if, uh, if that is true. I didn't know that. But yeah, I was a centre till I was Oh, well, there you go. Wow. <clears throat> so he was the boy then. Favourite stadium? Uh, international would be the Millennium. Great noise, great atmosphere. Club would be Welford Road. Favourite gym exercise? Favourite gym exercise? Like one specific exercise? Yeah, like, I don't know, rowing machine or squat or... Bicep curls, easy. <laughs> nice. Gun show. It's probably the only thing I can do these days. <laughs> <laughs> Occupation if rugby didn't exist. I wanted to join the army. So I was nice. going through... Uh, um, I forget what you call it now, but sort of um, university through officer training was was my dream. But my other dream took over. Rugby to yeah. a professional when I left school. Superstitions. Playing or non-playing? Uh, playing. Uh, I had many, which I kept trying to reduce. So I used to go to the cinema the night before to get a try celebration and relax. I used to have to wear my match shirt under my warm-up top when I went out to warm up, even if it was like 30 degrees. <laughs> I had to do exactly three tuck jumps when I entered the pitch. I had to sprint onto the pit. Oh, yeah, it was endless. I could keep going for hours. <laughs> wow. And lastly, best thing about working in rugby? This might sound strange. I sort of automatically want to say the people, but the physical outlet was, for me, the absolute best because I don't get it anywhere near as much as I did then, and I absolutely loved it. I think that's a nice coming full circle because we're obviously hearing there how you earned your name, nickname Mad Dog. Thank you for doing that, Lewis. While that's happened, a wild Nick Kane has just entered the four. Nick, how are the teeth? Uh, yeah, a bit, um, bit numb in the mouth at the moment, but uh, I'll get over it. <laughs> <laughs> nice to see you, Lewis, and you, Bren. And Hi, you, mate. Happy New Year. Yeah, Happy yeah, New Year. Year. And to you. Yeah, and good, to, to you. good to have you with us. Well, I'm going to throw you straight in the deep end if the the numb jaw can handle it. Um, yeah. It is time to pick our England 15. Now, we've probably got about 35 minutes left, if that. So we've done this once before with Toby Flood. It won't be as in-depth as that due to time restrictions. But, Nick, you said that the scrum will be hugely important in France. I think all of us would agree. I'm going to go. Let's hear your front row. OK, um, starting front row, everybody being fit, would be uh, uh, Rapava Ruskin at loose head, Cowan Dickey. And Nick Shonnet at tight head. I had a feeling you'd say that. And you you alluded to that in your... Do you think Shonnet has put himself forward by essentially that performance against Dan Cole in December? Uh, well, uh, you know, I mean, Cole was obviously opposite um, opposite uh, Simon McIntyre. Sorry, yes, yeah. But uh, Shonnet... The thing about Shonnet is what, what England have got to do, in my view is, you know, not try and run before they can walk and they need to learn to walk again. What they need to do is to make sure that they win their own ball, that they're really solid on their own ball. And if they can disrupt on the opposition ball, that is a bonus. But they need to make sure of real stability on their own ball, which is something that they, they, they've they lost almost completely. And Shonat, I watched him yesterday uh, against Quinns. And what struck me about him is he, is that he didn't actually, he was playing against a young loosehead uh, Buchanan, I think, at, at Quinn's, who had a rough ride the week before, and they'd obviously worked on him. 
and sometimes a week can do wonders. Um, and he was he was okay, you know, he was he was solid enough on the Quinns ball, but Sales ball was rock solid. Uh, while while Shonak was on, actually wasn't after he went off. But so so for me, that is what you need is real stability. That tight head must be an anchor man. And um, you know, I, I think Rapava Ruskin can, you know, is a disruptive scrummager. He's a he's he's a very powerful man, very powerful scrummager, and also extremely good around the field. I think that in the autumn. Uh, you know, maybe some people have got short memories, but in the autumn, England's scrum was just chronic. It was awful. And, you know, however good people may think that Kyle Sinclair and Ellis Genge are around the field, they have a primary responsibility, and that is the scrum. So that and, and Lewis has played behind, you know, great packs. So I'd be very interested to hear what he's got to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Lewis, I think the gauntlet's been thrown down. Let's hear your front row if you can venture one. Yeah, well, so before before I give you that, uh, Nick, Nick's point of um, you know Steve Borthwick's been 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 banging on about the basics. So I think you know Nick's point about needing um, a rock solid foundation from scrum and set pieces is, is definitely going to be an area he's looking at. Front row certainly wouldn't be my speciality, <laughs> um, but that Ruskin lad I have really enjoyed, and I know he can play both sides. Um, I know Borthers in his first season at Leicester was really excited and picked as his captain of that Leicester side, Ellis Genge, because of the individual that he is and the temperament and the attitude that he brings towards playing and training. Um, so there's a bit of a there's a bit of a change up. I'd have Genge, I'd have Cowan Dickey, obviously hoping that he's fit because he's a tenacious little hard nut. Again, I think Steve would like he's consistent. Um, hopefully he can be fit. And I'd have Ruskin, but tight because maybe not his preferred position, but he can play both. And, and to Nick's point, he is he's an immense player. And and if you're picking on form, you know, he has to start. That's very interesting. Brendan, have you got... So Rapava Ruskin, it seems to be sort of, I guess, the common <laughs> denominator here. Brendan, have you got him in your front well, row? I think he'll go with Ellis Genge. And he played brilliantly under Steve Borthwick for Leicester. Uh, he's not been on the... He hasn't shown that form at Bristol, but, you know, if, if Steve Borthwick can do anything... To, to breathe real life back into Ellis Genge. I think he'll go with Ellis Genge. I've been quite impressed with the way that Jamie George has bounced back. I mean, I've no problem with Cowan Dickey whatsoever, uh, other than he needs to <laughs> talk about tackling technique. He needs to be a bit careful with some of these no-arm chop tackles. But actually, I'd go with Jamie George, but no problem with either. And I'm, I'm going to back Nick Kane here, who knows much more about uh, props than I'll ever know. And if he rates uh, Nick Shonet, uh, I'll go with that. Um, it's certainly, I agree totally that England have got to address the scrum. And I'm sure that will be their priority in training throughout the, the two weeks or whatever if they get together and throughout the tournament, actually. That's where the major remedial work will be done. Nick, I'm going to come to you. Where are we at on Will Stewart, who obviously impressed probably more than Carl Sinclair did in the autumn, particularly in that New Zealand game? Well, he didn't. He, you know, I mean, I thought that what he did in uh, snaffling his two tries was impressive, and you'd say that about any prop. You know, being in the right place at the right time, making sure that they are. But I thought his scrummaging was 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 really poor. I mean, he was lifted off his feet. He was forklifted in the air by Kitsoff, and um, I, I don't think he's there yet. You know, I mean, I, I think he's. Yeah, you know, there are a lot of tight heads that England have got to really work on. You know, I mean, Joe Hayes is another, you know, he hasn't really trained on. So it's it's a position of real weakness for England at the moment, you know, which is why the talk is of Dan Cole coming back. Yeah. You know, I mean, I don't see Cole, Dan Cole starting, but I think he can certainly shore up a scrum, uh, you know, better than some of the younger guys coming through. So... Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm not. Uh, I wouldn't. I'm not in 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 a rush uh, regarding Will Stewart. We're one unit into the team, and it's already seeming like this is going to be very difficult to put together something of a fifteen <laughs> at the end. <laughs> Let's go to the second <laughs> row, and then we'll figure out. I'll I'll say fifteen names at the end based on roughly what the consensus somewhat seems to be. Second row, Lewis. I'm going to come to you first. Okay, mate. Well. I do not. This is an area, especially with the changes that Eddie made, moving guys into the into the back row. You know, Toji and, and Laws both being mixed around, and uh, and actually some of the young lads that they brought in, Coles and Ribbons, 
I thought had had moments of uh, of quality during uh, during the autumn. But I think again, coaches tend to look at people they know and trust. Um, at Toji, I think moving back to what I feel is his best position um, in the second row, and I bring in Chesham. So one of those changes. Uh, I know Steve's worked with him. I know he's highly rated and he's a hard grafter. So I think those simple elements and he'd come in obviously for Cole, one of the one of the Coles or or even so that'd be my two. Just jumping the gun a little bit then is who is your six? Well, so if you want do you want me to give you my back row as well whilst we're in Yeah, there? go on then. Go on. yeah, we're type for time, so that might actually work better. So the best combination I've ever seen in having a back row is Underhill, Curry and Vunapola. Vunapola is not playing as well as I would like, certainly not in an England shirt. So I'd like to see Don Brandt brought back in. Um, he adds a little bit of so Curry and Underhill are your classic grafters. They add skill, pace. Underhill will do a job in an area specific to his control. And Don Brandt brings that element of calm, attacking poise that, you know, when you've got Nick Evans in there, knows him well. You've got Marcus Smith, yeah. who I'd have in there. That that would be an exciting back row for me. Whether it will materialise or not is a vastly different uh, matter. <laughs> Okay, interesting. Now I'm going to throw in it. Obviously, the name that a lot of people will be thinking, you know, hasn't been said there is Courtney Laws, Brendan, and or Nick. Do either of you have Courtney in there? And is he your captain well, as well? Uh, if he's fit and healthy, I think you go with a Tojo and Laws in the second row. But Courtney hasn't played any rugby for yeah. three or four months now, uh, and I don't see he can just hit the ground running. So I think at least for the Scotland match, I'd be surprised if you don't have to come up with a, another combination. And that makes it very close. I've been impressed with David Ribbons, uh, not just for those cameo moments in the autumn, but also in the Northampton pack, which isn't the biggest, beefiest. He, he seems to make a big impact. So I think I'd probably possibly go with him for the Scotland match. We'll, we'll see how Courtney, you know, uh, his state of fitness come the training camp. And what's your back row? Back row is Tom Pearson at six. I don't. I think it's about time. I, I was pushing for him, if you remember, for the Australia tests. And they didn't even take him on the tour in the end. But uh, I think he's fantastic going forward. He's got the right attitude. I think England need a big ball carrier there. Billy's not quite the force he is. And I'm not picking Billy anyway, actually. Uh, I'm having Alex Donbrandt at eight. Tom Curry is fit. Again, we've got another injury issue there. Uh, so that that would be my back row. I wouldn't rule out Sam Underhill. But again, again, a guy with almost no rugby in months and months and months. You know, do you seriously pick him for the first match against Scotland? I don't think so. No. Nick? Um, I um locks if if Courtney Laws doesn't manage to get any game time before the Scotland game, he's going to be struggling, you know, to to to, to start. So that throws the captaincy open. I I think that my preferred if Laws was fit, my preferred second row would be uh, like Lewis would be Chesham and Itoji. If he's not fit, I'd like to see a um, perhaps Ribbons get a chance with Itoji and move Chesham to blindside, possibly. Blindside's a difficult one. Ben Earl so far this season has probably been the pick of all the open sides. You know, Tom Curry has blown a bit hot and cold. He's looking much better at the moment. Um, but his brother actually looks as effective as he does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, his brother's a really good player, you know, and it, it's sort of one of those extraordinary things where, you know, Jones actually in the first instance was looking at Ben and he hasn't had a look in <laughs> because he got injured and uh, Tom was brought in uh, in Argentina. So, look, my back row, I, I also somebody who's in France at the moment, who I definitely, I, I take the point about Pearson, he's played very, very well and consistently well. But uh, Jack Willis, I feel, has got to come into uh, any back row equation. Don Brandt, I agree with at the moment. And, you know, as far as the open side's concerned, I'd be happy to see uh, Earl or Ben Curry. Tom Curry looks as if he might struggle a bit. Just with this hamstring thing, I guess if he if he wasn't struggling, he'd be in that mix too. But I'd keep open sides on the open side. I'd look for a, a bigger man who brings something different, like Willis uh, on the blind side, or Chesham and um, and Don Brandt at eight. It's not clear yet, is it, Nick, whether England are going to permit players in France to be selected, or, or have, uh, have I missed the memo on that? 
Has that been altered? I thought that there'd been, I don't know. I mean, I thought that there might have been a memo out there that uh, WASP players who've gone to France might be eligible. I mean, that, that would sound fair enough. And in fact, yeah. I've always thought that players in France should be eligible. But, but you know, England have sort of uh, made it a point of honour, haven't they, over the last years not to select players in France. So, yeah, need an official word on that. Yeah. I think that's right. I think the WASP players were given dispensation for this uh, for this season, weren't they? Yeah, just, I don't know yeah. that's a fact, but I, that's certainly what I heard. No, I, th- I I think that's the case as well with Jack Willis. So we've got through the pack. Let's move on to the back line. Half backs will go. We'll have nine and ten from you, Brendan. Please. Uh, right, I've um I've switched a bit from JVP to um, Alex Mitchell at nine. I've just been really impressed with what Mitchell's been doing. Not always behind a dominant pack. And the one thing he brings is fantastic tempo to whatever Northampton do. And I think England need tempo. And I'd like to, you know, I know you mustn't always think about World Cup, but it is now only eight months away, nine months away. And I think Alex Mitchell could be a person we England need involved. And if that's the case, you work back, he has to get some starting game time now. I don't know what, I think Rafi Quirk's still injured. I've been a big Rafi Quirk. And, but he doesn't seem to be on the on the scene at the moment. I think it has to be the moment you move away from Ben Young's great servant that he's been. And actually, he's not playing that badly at the moment, but there has to come a moment when you make that break. And I think it might be this Six Nations. Anyone else got Alex Mitchell? <laughs> Chris Silas Hewitt would, would suggest no. You know Chris Hewitt would. Chris he, probably would, yeah. Leader of the fan club. He's not here. So. He's absent. <laughs> <laughs> Lewis, I, I what have you gone for? Well, I wouldn't have seen enough of uh, of Alex Mitchell. Like I said earlier, you know, my um, I love watching as much rugby as possible, but my ability to watch all games uh, or anywhere near all games these days is diminished by my watching of my own kids' sport. So, um, and and looking at the team that I've selected as well, I'm going to slightly go uh, against what Brendan said, and I don't doubt Alex is probably a, a wonderful young talent, but the team I've selected, which which sees a few changes and young guys coming in. I would start. I would start with Ben. I just think it gives an element of stability. If Don Brandt's there as well, you've got a little bit of consistency. Ben's actually been playing well. I thought, you know, uh, Van Portfleet is going to be a talent. I don't think he's quite ready yet, um, and I think that autumn series maybe allowed us to see that he deserves more opportunities because he's quality. Um, but I'd start with Youngs. He just gives a bit of stability and control. Maybe not what people want to see, but we've got outside of Youngs for me. We've got a lot of excitement that can be unleashed. So. Um, that stability sometimes uh, allows us the platform in my eyes. I take it then Marcus Smith is your 10? Indeed he is. He is. Sorry, okay. I forgot about that. No, no, that's all right. <laughs> but Brendan, who's your 10? Actually, yeah, so I didn't, um, I was just about to finish off it. I'm actually going to go Owen Farrell at 10, having been a, a big supporter of Marcus Smith. I, I think there were just one or two chinks in his armour were exposed over the last year. A great talent, and in fact, a fantastic talent to come off the bench. I mean, he's almost your ideal bench player. For 30 minutes, but I think Owen Farrell is playing very well. He's obviously got a slight disciplinary cloud over him at the moment, and we'll find out more about that later this week. But if the if the ban allows him to, I, I think I'd probably start with him. It is probably worth mentioning that at the time time of recording, I think just this morning, um, Owen Farrell was cited for that tackle over the weekend. So we'll see what comes of that. Nick, let's hear your nine ten, please. Yeah, I mean, I think that. Um... Nines always need time or usually need time to bed in at international level. I really liked what I saw Van Poortvliet in Australia. I think that young scrum half playing behind a, you know, ordinary pack at best um, in the autumn isn't the best uh, sort of uh, platform for him. I think that, he, he looked more, you know, one of the things that I noticed in Australia was the speed of his past, the speed of his thinking, so on. And in the autumn, a lot of that seemed to have gone. And, you know, there was sort of confusion about a lot of what England were doing. So I I, I think he was, was trapped with that. Tigers have been, you know, up and down this season as well. You know, I mean, the last two, two weekends, they've been hammered. So I don't know. I, I, I don't think Ben moves the ball quickly enough for the game that England want to play. The thing that I notice about him and the young scrum halves is that his delivery is often a lot slower. 
he's obviously extremely accomplished, hugely experienced and so on. But I do think that it's time for that break. And I think you've got to back, you know, if you think that a, a young scrum half has got talent, you've got to back him. Now, Quirk is apparently back in training. So he'd be definitely in the frame for me. I like Mitchell too. I, I get the bit about uh, about tempo. I think that they've got three very good young scrum halves coming through. The bloke in possession at the moment is Van Poortvliet, and I'd stick with him for the moment. I back Smith as well, but he's not played since the autumn. Yeah, he's injured yeah. as well. So, you know, it's again a really difficult one. Farrell has been playing and has been playing extremely well. Um, and apart from, you know, the the sort of the, the fact that he's got the league ri- rising shoulder um, in his DNA almost um, is a is a big thing. You know, I mean, this whether I mean, I don't know what sort of bands people have been getting for shoulder to the head. But if he gets anything less than anybody else. It's going to look just, be, you know, because England are playing Scotland in the first weekend in February, it's going to look extremely bad. So there's got to be consistency along that uh, disciplinary line. And um, Marcus Smith may be in by default. Well, it, there's a still doubt over his, uh, I think I heard yesterday, you know, he's training, but he's still no contact or anything yet. So he's going to be another one, either very short of rugby or still yeah. with a slight trailed over his fitness altogether. So, you know, watch this space, I think, with England 10. It could become a little bit bit messy. Yeah. Who's next? Ollie. Who is next? <laughs> That's Ollie, a very good yeah, question. Ollie, quick question for you then. Who's next? Who do you have in if they're both injured? Uh, someone else help me out. I, I don't know. Well, well, yeah, I mean, so- what... He's Although he's slightly up at the moment, I think. He, well, a very he, fine he also finished the, finished the game for Leicester on one leg pretty well. Yeah. You know, so <laughs> I, I don't know about him. Jacob I'm not sure that Joe, Joe Simmons has not really gone on from where they where where he did when Exeter were uh, you know won the European Cup uh, two uh, just over two years ago now. Um, so yeah, I mean England are um, are struggling there. But... Someone someone that had been in the squad was uh, Orlando Bailey as a, as a young England yeah. under twenty. But you know you wouldn't. You know, be a big game to throw a young man uh, into for your first mm. Six Nations. You'd probably look at you'd probably look at a Simmons, someone with a little bit more experience mm. um, to I mean, start. But that's be a I scary to, position to be in. I have to, to say, the, the the guy who really impressed me, and this is just out of the blue. I haven't seen him before. Is a guy called Connor. Conan, who played for uh, Newcastle, um, yeah, terrific on Saturday at, at the weekend. I mean, look, I don't think you can pick somebody on I, I, unless you've been watching him over a long, uh, a long period over the course of the season, and he's been doing that over the course of the season, and that's the selector's job to know that or or, or not know that. But he looked an extremely tidy player to me. Um, but you know, I mean, it's a it's a hell of a long shot. That's very interesting because I'm trying to think back to the last person who wore 10 for England in a, you know, a first choice team that wasn't Ford, Farrell or Smith. Is Rob Dupree England qualified now? I don't know. I don't think he's played for South Africa, has he? Has he not? He's been in a squad, but I was trying to look this up last night. I don't think he's played for him. So I don't think he's been captured yet. I don't, to be fair, I don't think I've ever heard him talk about any England aspirations. No. Um, But... uh, He's one of the form 10s, isn't he, in the Premiership? He has a South Africa cap, one cap in 2018. There you go. Oh, He's out. <laughs> that one down then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Well, I mean, Joe, Joe Simmons is he is the player with with track record, if you like, at the highest level. Mm. Um, you know, he's been a European Cup winner. He's been a Premiership winner. His form has been pretty patchy, but he's been moved around. Uh, they had Skinner at uh, at fly half at the start of the season. Now Simmons is back in that position, but Exeter aren't playing. You know, Exeter aren't the Exeter of old, and um, they don't have the, that sort of pack dominance that they've that they've had previously. But I, I I would say just in terms of experience and in terms of ability, certainly shown in the past, I'd say that he'd probably be the uh, the surest English bet. It would be a crazy conundrum to have to pick from. I'm sure both has, has got a solution and so does Nick, but it would be a tough decision to make. Who was the young lad who moved from Worcester to Northampton at 10? Smith. 
Finn Smith, he's high. He's sort of almost. He's been in the squad, doesn't he? I think he's pretty highly rated. I think, although he's only twenty. Yeah. So he, he my, I don't think they'd go to him, but he is. He's on the radar for sure. But what we're saying essentially is that if Smith isn't fit and Farrell gets his time, we're going to have someone making their debut at fly half. Could well be. Which uh, George is Ford. No, he's not. Pretty he's tans- fit, I don't think he is, is he? No, he's, he's, no a, he's a maybe for partway through the tournament, I yeah. think, but he won't be ready for Scotland. So very, very interesting. Well, look, I've got to write something down. So we'll go with Smith at 10 because that was, I think, two of you said Smith and one said Farrell. I think two of us said Farrell, didn't we? Yeah, no, it was the other way. Yeah. Was it? Nick, yeah, I thought yeah. you said... I um, said Farrell. Yeah. Yeah. Nick, I, Nick, I thought you said Smith. I said that I, I, I would if he if he'd played any rugby, but he hasn't. And okay. Farrell's been playing well. We'll go you with know. Aaron Farrell. And the nines, we had three different nines. So I guess I'm the deciding vote, which doesn't seem quite right. But I've gone with Jack Van Portfleet. Not because I think he is necessarily the best nine in the country, but because I think someone needs a show of faith at this point rather than this. Give a nine a go for three games, and if it doesn't work, go back to Ben Youngs. Yeah. So put down JVP and Farrell. Yep. Going well. <laughs> 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 All right, let's go to the midfield. Nick, I think this is actually a little bit less contentious than it has been in the past, but I'm willing to be told otherwise. Well, a couple of weeks ago, I picked a team which had... Ollie Lawrence at inside centre and Henry Slade at outside centre. I've watched um, Manu Tuilagi closely over. I, I think he's been incredibly quiet. I think he's been very. He was very quiet in the autumn, and I think he's been pretty quiet for sale as well. And almost as if he's been wrapped in cotton wool too much. Looking at him yesterday, opposite Esther Hazen, I, I thought he had a good game. And he looked more like the player um, that England need. And we know that he's a big game player, you know. So I'm going to say to Ilagi, because of experience and because of the power that he that he brings. I I feel that Lawrence is is very unfortunate. And I'd certainly, if there's room on the bench, I'd have him on the bench for certain. Brendan. We, we've <laughs> we've had the manager discussion many times, haven't we? Like Nick, I think he was he was definitely looking a bit better yesterday, but I I still have this issue that we've been talking about Manu for thirteen years now, as if he is the only thing, only player around whom England can build a back division. And on three or four occasions, New Zealand World Cup semi final, Ireland away that year as well, that's worked out. But a lot of the time, it doesn't work out. I think England are over focused. On Manu. So I'm going to acknowledge that he's in good nick. Uh, he's not looking bad at all. I'd have him on the bench and I'd use him for good minutes, 35, 40 minutes. It's not, not a cameo, Manu. Um, but I'm going to go. I've got great faith in Ollie Lawrence, but I see him as a 13, not a 12. He's not a headbanger. He's not a truck it up merchant. He's much yeah. better than that. And I want to see him at 13. And if I want to see Manu in the outside channel as well when he comes on, Manu always plays best. For England, when he's in the 13th shirt, I always think. I, so, I, I disagree, Bren. Go back to that Ireland game. He's at 12. The one yeah, but the New Zealand semi final, he's, he's at 13. Played at 13. And he was at 13 when they beat New Zealand in 2012 when he had Brad Barrett inside him. Yeah. So, well, listen, yeah, it's debatable. But I, my, my gut feeling is that 13 is where he causes good defenses, see him come in at 12. He can he can test them more at 13, in my opinion. But anyway, I want Ollie Lawrence to play 13. I want Manu with big minutes on the bench. And I want a playmaker at 12. And we haven't seen the best of Henry Slade. And I remember Henry Slade early in his career played a lot at 12, played a lot at 10, actually. And if we're ever going to get the best out of Henry Slade, I think this might be the moment to slot him at 12, just to give the second play option, to try and bring out the best of uh, Ollie Lawrence stroke Manu when he comes on. And then... Well, we get to it. That would give an exciting back three more opportunities, I think. I'm interested to hear the back three, but Lewis, let's hear your midfield first. Well, to, uh, you know, the, the Manu discussion has always uh, fascinated me. And I think for too long, he is a wonderful player when he's on his game. There's no one like him. But for too long, you know, we've tried to build a team around him and and he's never, you know, he's just not been in the team. So, um, you know, I would like to move away from the Manu conversation and, 
you know, the reason I had Ben Youngs at, at Scrum Half was to bring some stability to what would be a slightly younger backline. And, uh, you know, Dan Kelly has been uh, doing some interesting things. I think he's an exciting talent. He's been going well for a, for a couple of seasons. Um, I'd bring him in. And I have always loved Henry Slade. I think he's a remarkable player. Um, we don't always see the best of him in an England shirt, but he is so gifted that he needs to be uh, he needs to be playing. So I'd have him in as a, as a little bit of experience outside Manu or Oli Lawrence. Oli Lawrence has been since I've been down to a few Bath games this year. I don't get to many live matches anymore, but I've been to Bath and uh, well, so it, it's been fascinating to watch the the progress that young men are making. But Manu, for me, it need, we need to move away from that. I tend to agree. So we've got Slade in. All all of us have because I've got Slade in as well, and then. We've got one Kelly, one Slade, one, uh, one Lawrence, one Manu. I had Ollie Lawrence as well. I think we'll go with Ollie Lawrence then. And the 12-13, whether you wear 12-13, we'll just leave it there for the moment. Or we'll leave that up to Steve Borthwick. But I think there is a general-ish consensus that Manu, it might be time to move on. But him off, a be- off the bench coming at, at a tired defence could be pretty devastating. Okay, Finally, let's go for the back three. Lewis, could I hear your left and right wing? I'm going to hazard that fullback is going to be a four out of four. Probably our only four out of four. Well, if you're going for, uh, for Anthony Watson. <laughs> <laughs> joking, joking, joking. <laughs> yeah, Stuart, Stuart would, be, uh, would be nailed on at fullback. He's class. I've loved him from the moment I've yeah. seen him in England. Well, from the moment I saw him in a Leicester jersey. Consistent, rugged, tough, brilliant. No um, objections from Nick and Brendan, I'm going to no, say. No, he's, he's no. I'll, I'll write that in now. And then let's hear your wingers, Lewis. So maybe uh, as a bit of a, well, as some change up, I'd bring Watson back in. I think he's been on uh, scintillating form. He is a great professional. His attitude is is second to none um, from the individuals that I speak to around camp. He sometimes gets brushed with um, with other people, but I've only ever seen him hardworking. And when he's on form, scintillating. So he'd be in. And uh, also, Hassel Collins, bearing in mind if everyone's fit, I just think we need a finisher. And and he's been that man. And I've loved watching him play again. Henry Andor isn't fit. He would have been my starter because he's quality, quite frankly. You know, his, his debut against Australia just made me sit up and go, that is how you take your opportunity, right? As, as, a, as a player, all you want young men to do is come into the squad and go, guys, this is why I should be playing with you. Uh, and that's what he did. And I'm so... Disappointed for him that he's injured, but if he's not there, Ollie comes in for me. I'm, I'm totally with you, Lewis, and the entire back three combo. Anthony Watson, there is a slight injury doubt on him, but uh, I think he's going to be okay. One of the reasons I, I'd want him in is I think Freddie Stewart is England's best attacking back. He's a fantastic player going forward, and England's only beginning <laughs> to realise that now. So you need one of the wings needs to be also, almost a specialist fullback to be able to drop back and cover if needed. Anthony Watson feels that, and so does Henry Arundel, actually. He, he's played most of his rugby at fullback. And I'll ch- chuck another name in who's impressed me all season. is Ben Loder at London Irish, yeah. who, again, is that quintessential 15-14. So Watson to start, Arundel hopefully to get fit and maybe get some game time and and keep an eye on Ben Loder. I think he's a coming player. Odia Hassel Collins on the other wing, without question for me. He's earned it. Nick, round us off. <laughs> Yeah, two names not not mentioned so far. One's Cockenasiga, and the other one is Tommy Freeman, who is, I think, I'd be right in saying the man who <laughs> he's obviously been there when Hassel Collins hasn't. <laughs> not sure that he's really taken his chance recently. Last season, Freeman had a brilliant, brilliant run of form. Probably better than that. I mean, Hassel Collins has been scoring tries for fun, but probably even better than Hassel Collins has been this season. But I guess, I mean, it's a very difficult one. Do you go? Do you? Do you know? Do you back people or or do you go with form? And we sort of say that we should go with form, and particularly with wingers, people who are finishing well, you can't ignore. So Hassel Collins, I, I'm prepared to go with with him Watson I saw the try that he scored against Claremont which was which was brilliant I haven't really seen that much more from him and he's been he came into the team late during the lesser team late during the season he's now injured again or certainly was rested this last weekend so I'm not entirely sure 
I think that, you know, he's obviously a class player, huge experience. I don't. I, I, I'm. I'm happy to see him. Him there. I'd be happy to see Cockenasiga get a run. He did nothing wrong in the autumn. In fact, he did a lot right. And when you've got a guy of that size, you know, two guys like Stewart and Cockenasiga, if they uh, if they're coming into the ball in the onto the ball in the right places, they're potentially a devastating combination. All right. Well, there's been some sort of consensus. It'll be fascinating to see how that lines up. Compared to England, Scotland you, in February. You can't ever have been expecting consensus. No, no, no. <laughs> the, exact, the back line is actually better than I did expect, to be fair. The pack, a okay. little bit less so. But um, this one is but... 3D chess, isn't it? I mean, the selection's difficult enough, but you've got a new yeah. coach. We haven't even named a squad yet. He's going to name 45 names. We've got about 10 people injured. Yeah. And it's a very specific match, Scotland at home. I mean, this is the selection meeting of all selection meetings. I'm amazed we've even got five we agree on. <laughs> and he can only change six. He can only change six of those as well, right? Yeah. How mad yeah. is that? Yeah. So so really, I mean, there's yeah, that's, it makes it even harder for him. You can't even... It's, it's tough. Good. It's going to be exciting, though. I, yeah. I, I genuinely am excited. <laughs> and that, that fly-half debate that we've raised is a particularly interesting one, and one I, that hadn't really occurred to me. But if Farrell is banned, then we'll see who wears 10. Um well, Ollie, could I quickly say I didn't yeah, give you my cap, and you you didn't ask actually, so that's why I haven't given it to you. They're Sorry. not as a, not as a criticism at all, but just as a, I would have with uh, with no laws, no foul in my team, I would have um, Ellis Genge, someone yeah, that, that Steve so. knows. And and if you're looking for attitude and and setting uh, your stall out early, there's no doubt that that Genge brings that in a similar sort of way, and not comparing, but that Jono used to start games. Yeah, you know, climbing into the opposition. Genge is my captain as well. Not mine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, that's why the debate's so good, right? Yeah. <laughs> Nick, who is your captain? <clears throat> Look, if it uh, as with uh, Lewis, if Courtney Laws and Owen Farrell are unavailable, Farrell wouldn't be my captain anyway. Laws would definitely, if he was fit and match match prepped, he'd be my captain. But without him, I'd go to Itoji. I think that Itoji is the one name on the team. The, the reason that I wouldn't go for Ellis Genge, I, look, I hear the Tigers stuff uh, about about him, but you know, okay, he's gone to he's gone back home. He's gone to Bristol. Uh, you wouldn't expect him to be made captain in his you know in his first season back, and so on and so forth. But they're bottom of the table at the moment, you know, and. I'm just, you know, I, I'm I'm not totally convinced by the leadership. There are a lot of leaders in that um, uh, Leicester team, um, Montoya in particular, you know. So and Liebenberg, you know. So the 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 Leicester team that won the Premiership, I think um, there were there were a number of people who offered leadership in that team. Genji is not certain of his position. With I, I'd never heard that R- Rapava Ruskin could play on the tight head before Lewis said, said so. Um, but I, I'm wary of people being picked out of the position that they're playing in regularly. So I would say, you know, that the, that the guy I've thought was captaincy material. He's one of the first names on the team sheet. One of the only England players who would have a prayer of getting into a World 15 at the moment is Dodgy. I would concur entirely with that, um, Nick. In fact, we we did actually raise it a couple of weeks ago, didn't we? We did, it might yeah. not be that. Might not be the worst thing for Itoji, the individual player anyway, that's no. the captaincy. And in, in the absence of Laws and Farrell, I'd certainly go with Itoji. He's one of the three or four bankers in the team. And I think he'd, he'd raise his game and he'd probably n- tighten down uh, his discipline. And he'd yeah. be, I, I'd think he'd do very well. I'd have no less problem. Of the back, less of the back slapping and, you yeah, know, and the hollering and the shouting. And, yeah. and, and he'd, he'd have to lead by example. And that would be, include not giving. Away four or five penalties a match. But the yeah. one thing we also did say was that it was weird that he'd never even been given a vice captain role. So I, you that was an Eddie Jones thing. There was obviously something. You think it was an Eddie? Yeah, yeah maybe. I do. Uh, I agree with that. You know, I mean, he captained. We we talked about it. He captained that England under twenty side that won in twenty fourteen. Yeah, that's true. Well, look, I've got Genge as my captain, but I would be equally happy with it, OJ. So to run down what we've managed to concoct. <laughs> Genge, either captain or one of the vice captains, potentially for Tojo's captain. Cowan Dickey, then Shonat, 
or Rapava Ruskin, but probably Shonat, um, because I don't know when the last time Rapava Ruskin played tight head was. Itoje, Chesham, Slash Laws, Curry, Earl, Dombrandt, JVP at nine, Farrell, 10. Nick, who was your other winger? You had Hassel Collins. I had and... Hassel Collins, and I, I, I think I'd go for uh, Cockin' Asiga. Okay, three of us went for Watson, I think. So yeah. we'll stick with him. So Watson and Hassel Collins on the wings. Yeah. Stewart at fullback and Lawrence and Slade in the centres. That probably made no sense to our listeners, but <laughs> it made no sense to us either. <laughs> Actually, the team, the team in the end, the the consensus team is a is a is is a pretty good side. It's not a bad team. I don't think too many people would argue with too much of that. Should that team take the field come Six Nations time, but. Yeah, very, very interesting. Yeah. Lewis, really, really great having you. It's been a cracking start to season two of the Rugby Paper podcast. So thank you so much for coming. And yeah, all the best with the bike ride in France. And I will definitely be getting vo- involved in some Lewis Moody Foundation skydiving at some point in the future. Okay, mate, I won't be with you. I'll just put that out there. <laughs> <laughs> You're yeah, on your own. <laughs> I promote it, but I won't be with you. Yeah. All right, guys. Thanks, Ollie. Brendan, Thanks, Nick. Lewis. Take care, boys. Great to see you. Bye. As always, the rugby paper is available in stores on Sundays or get it delivered to you through our digital subscription. We will see you next week.